Children, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you all around the four quarters of the globe. And as always, it is great to have you here, all our regulars, all the new members. As always, we shall start with some important housekeeping rules. And uh, as you know, our meetings are being recorded and posted onto our YouTube page. So those of you who do not wish to be seen, please switch your mics off and your videos off. To avoid any disruptions around, uh, during the talk, we'd ask you to ensure that your microphones are kept on mute throughout. That's my daughter, by the way, sorry about that. There will be a Q&A session after the talk. If you'd like to ask today's speaker a question, please use the hand up icon, which can be found in the participants or reactions tab on Zoom. Once you have done this, please wait for your name to be called out. You may then unmute yourself, ask your question, but please do not forget to mute yourself again. Save your spot on the queue. Uh, you can do this at any time during the talk. We will be notified and uh, you will be called in due time. I'd also like to uh, ask the brethren to uh, keep your questions on topic and in question format. We don't want any uh, statements that are gonna prolong the chat for no uh, specific reason. Now, as always, we're also giving our uh, two bespoke mugs uh, to uh, two lucky winners. For a chance to win, please answer the follow very easy question. Who are the three first masters that bore sway at the building of the first temple in Jerusalem? Uh, please type your questions and two first correct answers will win. Is chat turned on? Uh, good evening. Okay. okay, that was easy. Uh, we already have our winners. Thank you, uh, brethren. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce worth, uh, worshipful brethren Philip Stamfast and Michael Bottomley. Brother Stamfast became a Freemason in 1986 and joined SRIA the following year. He is now ninth degree and past suffragan. He joined the August Order of Light on 20th of September, 1987, and is now a joint arch president of the, uh, of the order. He first became interested in the, esoteric, uh, in the esoteric through fiction. He then began to attend Stockport Lodge of the Theosophical Society in the 70s, and then progressed into Freemasonry, joining his father's lodge in 1986. Brother Botany joined the order of the Cubic Stone 1987 until 1984, and Lightcliffe Lodge 332 under the UGLE on February 1985, where he, uh, and he currently acts as a past uh, junior grand deacon, uh, provincial. In 1987, uh, he joined the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross. Uh, he, and uh, sorry, in 1990, he joined the, fe uh, the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross, the August, of no of the August Order of Light, of course, 1987. Naturally, uh, suffice to say that uh, both Brother uh, Bottomley and Brother Stanfast have focused on the August Order of Life, which they are now both co-presidents on. And uh, they have been opening and founding temples in Australia, India, and America with membership growing from 70 brethren to well over 300. So uh, Brother Philip, and uh, Brother Michael, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for having us, uh, for being with us tonight. Michael, Philip, you may have to unmute yourselves. Uh, I mean, can you tell whether Philip's on the line? He was having some technical issues earlier. Uh, I think I, I may be okay now. Ah, yeah, got you. There we go. Thank Very you. Good. Okay. Yeah. Well, when the when the order was founded in January, is everyone hearing me? Over okay. No, I'm getting a lot of lot of echo. There's feedback. Turn your mic down. Is that better? Just keep talking, Philip. Okay. Right. 
on the 9th of August, 1902, just over, over 119 years ago, 10 regular freemates. Philip, can I, sorry, can I just stop you there? Can I just say, are you, if you're using a headset, do you want to use the computer instead of the headset? So take the headset out, maybe. Okay, I'm using the computer now. Any better? Not really. You're all left to win back at me. Okay, I think you have two connections. Um, uh, Philip, I think you have two connections simultaneously in the same room. Is that is that it? Yeah, he has to unplug his microphone and his earphone. He has Philip. to unplug it from his computer or Sorry, brother. His... excuse me, brother. Brother, excuse me. Philip, just turn off your speaker volume down completely. And then carry on speaking. Turn off your speaker volume down and carry on speaking, please. <clears throat> Got both mics turned off. Philip, the issue is that you've logged on twice. You've got two systems up. If you just take off the mic for one of them and keep the other one on mute, that should resolve the issue. Apologies, brethren. We will get this technical glitch sorted as soon as possible. Right. Philip, can you hear us? Uh, yes. That's much better. Brilliant. OK, I can't see anybody at the moment, but that's the, the least of my worries. We can see you and we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, brethren. Thank oh, you for your good. patience. Thank you. Sorry about this, uh, brethren. Uh, I've been using the, the system all day and I've not had this problem, but uh, here we are. Right. So, on the 9th of July. Sorry? Yes. Sorry? Yes. 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 Philip, if you, if you could carry on, please. On the 9th of January 1902, so that's just over 190 years, 19 years ago from today, 10 regular Freemasons met in the Royal Hotel in Bradford, Yorkshire, but to form an order to be known as the August Order of Light. There were other nine Freemasons who had, been consent, who had consented to be founders. These nine included Dr. Wynne Westcott, a well-known figure in occult and theosophical circles, the third arch presidents were to be Thomas Henry Pattinson, a, a watchmaker and jeweller, and Dr. Brogdon Edwards, a medical practitioner. Bradford was a prosperous mill city in the north of England, amongst those dark satanic mills of Blake's Jerusalem. It was perhaps not the most likely place for occult or esoteric orders to flourish, but as I will touch upon later, nothing could be further from the truth. It was recorded that Pattinson gave an exhaustive explanation of the object and working of the order, as handed down by Portman to Aden. Portman was a civil servant who spent time in the Andaman Islands. Those who Google him will see he is a controversial figure. Uh, you can find his regalia for the ancient and primitive rite, which was a, a Yarka organisation in the Museum of Grand, United Grand Lodge of England. Aden was an Anglican clergyman with an interest in occultism and alchemy. Edwards read out a portion of the intended ritual. This gives rise to a number of fundamental questions, three in particular. Firstly, what did Porton hand down to Aiton? And what did Aiton hand down to Pattinson and Edwards? And to what extent are the current rituals of the order and its workings as those uh, handed down by Aiton? And to what extent do they reflect the revisions which are said to have been made by Pattinson and Edwards? Much confusion is caused by the fact that Portman 
did create an order of light. But it's not clear to what extent that order of light was the foundation of our order. There are also documents related to a 49 apex ritual of perfection or seeker, which also bear the title of August Order of Light. That order was linked to another order with an Eastern content, the Sat Bihai. Throw into that mix the claims of a person who in some regard is a degree peddler, but John Yarker, and you have the perfect recipe for confusion. Taking those strands in turn, in 1881, a certificate was issued by Portman to Aiton, admitting him to the sixth and seventh grades of the Order of Light. I should say that the current order has only three degrees, a first passing and a second degree. Unfortunately, to, know, to my knowledge, there is no records of what those sixth and seventh grades represented. Were they simply titles or were they given as a result of having passed through any ritual? We simply do not know. In the following year, 1882, Aiton issued a certificate to Pattinson, admitting him to the first, second and third degrees of the order. Again, it does not indicate what, if any, rituals have taken place to admit Pattinson to those grades. We should note that this was 10 years before the foundation of our order of light, so any possible connection is separated by a decade. A puzzle then arises with a letter in the Library of the United Grand Lodge of England. It is from Porton to Ayton and is dated the 22nd of January 1886. It had been sent from the Andaman Islands. In it, Portman refers to the OOL, presumably Order of Light. He states that the ritual was drawn up entirely by a man called Palmer Thomas, and it is not in the least Eastern, nor is there any Eastern ritual to the grades. In the letter, he gives the entire control of that order to Yarka whom he gives liberty to make such alterations as he chooses, only keeping in mind that the order is a school for practical occultism. This cannot be our current order of light, which does have Eastern elements in its rituals, albeit our order is concerned with the search for occult knowledge. Portman then goes on to describe the workings of an order which does have Eastern connotations, uh, maybe a ritual, a reference to the Sattva High. Our, our current order does encompass Eastern influences amongst a number of others. It has never been, however, from its foundation, a Hindu or exclusively Eastern order. It encompasses a number of Western and Eastern traditions with a particular focus on their inner or more occult teachings. That letter is puzzling because if Aiden had taken part in any rituals or had been supplied with the rituals for the grades which he had achieved, why would Portman have to explain to him that there was no Eastern content? It may be safe to assume by that point, Aiden had not seen the rituals. I'll return shortly to the issue of Yarka. In 1887, Aiton, writing to an American neophyte of an order known as the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, describes the form of his initiation in that order as being much better than that of Portman's order. It would seem, therefore, that by that date, Aiton had participated in some ceremony of some order of light. Incidentally, Pattinson's application for membership of that order, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, was rejected. We don't know why, but he remained a close contact of Aiton. On the 18th of January, 1902, nine days after the founding of the current Order of Light, Aiton wrote to F.G. Irwin. He stated that the Order of Light had been left in his hands by Portman, that Yarker was not a member. He said that Portman at Yarker's request had allowed him, that is Aiton, to show Yarker the ritual and copy it, but nothing more. That obviously contrasts with the letter from Portman to Aiton in 1886, in which he gave control of that order of light to Yarker. Had Portman changed his mind? 
There are no documents in the archives of our order which makes any mention of, by, of Yarka in its foundation or subsequently development. In fact, by 1902, Yarka had become divorced from mainstream regular Freemasonry. Had he passed control of the order to Aiton? We don't know. As late as 15th of August, 1898 though, Aiton had been issuing a certificate to John Arthur Godwin, who was the first Lord Mayor of Bradford, admitting him to the first, second and third degrees. Godwin was to become a founding member of the current Order of Light. The warrant in the possession of the order is an authority from Portman to, uh, to permit Paterson and Edwards to admit mem members to the order and confirming their past actions in doing so. This implies that the warrant was issued sometime after the inaugural meeting, but is undated or alternatively, that some group had been active before that meeting in January 1902. Taking hold of the apex or seeker strand, although the document in the possession of the Library of the United Grand Lodge of England refers to the August Order of Light, I don't consider that it is the same as our current Order of Light. One of the copies in UGLE is annotated by Westcott, and it refers to it being copied in, in Edinburgh from, in 1883 and compared with that of Yarker in 1904. Well, by 1904, Westcott was already a member of the Order of Light as it exists today. So why would he have to compare it with that of Yarker, uh, which he said he did in 1904? So where does the ritual of our order come from and when? Well, in the late 19th and early 20th, 20th century, interest in the occult and spiritualism flourished no less in Bradford than anywhere else. The Theosophical Society had a lodge in Bradford. Pattinson was a member of the somewhat obscure Rose Crooks Fratres, who were based in Keithley, a short town, a town a short distance from Bradford, and who published a journal entitled The Lamp of Thoth in 1888. The Horus Temple of the Golden Dawn was established in Bradford in October 1888. The last recorded business of the Horus Temple is a letter in 1900 adjourning the decision to take rooms for the order. There's an undertone in that record that all was not well in the temple. The order nationally by 1900 was rent by schism. There was the scandal of the Horus sex abuse case which hit the national press. Now it may be, despite the shortage of documentary evidence, that its existence in some form continued on beyond that date, as I believe Michael Bottomley uh, account of our order would indicate. Of those early members of the Order of Light, a number of the members of the Horus Golden Dawn Temple, including Pattinson and Edwards, who had been leading members of the Horus Temple. Pattinson and Edwards were also members of the Theosophical Society and the Horus Lodge of its Eastern or Esoteric section. Pattinson, in fact, was the president of, of that section. Those influences can be seen in the rituals practiced by our order today. They cannot have been written in, in their present form before 1889, because they incorporate passages from a theosophical work which was not published until that year. They also contain portions of ritual which have come from the Golden Dawn. I don't feel that any member of the Golden Dawn would have been free to break their obligation until the order disintegrated, and this would put the incorporation of those Golden Dawn elements post-1900. There are, however, substantial portions of the ritual which are taken from the Sattva High or Seeker rituals. We know that Aiton was a member of the Sattva High, having joined in 1883, two years after he was admitted to grade six and seven of Portman's Order of Light. Portman's letter of 1886 to Aiton makes it clear that he was involved with the Sat Baha'i, but states that his order has no Eastern ritual. And it seems that the Sat Baha'i sections of our current ritual cannot have been part of Portman's original order. Let me turn to my original questions. 
I'm afraid I don't have any answers. And we can safely say that whatever may have come from Portman's original order must have been substantially revised to give the order its current form. There is every likelihood that Pattinson and Edwards are responsible for that. It is very much a child of the early 20th century, but I anticipate that Arch President Michael Hottomley will tell us that it doesn't, won't stay there. Thank you, brethren. That ends the, the first part of uh, the talk tonight, and I'll hand over to Arch President Michael Bottomley. Thank you, Philip. Uh, can everybody hear me, brethren? Yes, thank you. Loud and clear. Great. So, uh, is it possible to have the slide on? Yeah, you should be able to, Michael. Can you share your screen? Um, I can, I think. You'll need to enable that for me. Okay, so should already be done. Gadeep, can you uh, can you do that, please? Oh yeah, yeah, we got that now. All done. Right, just got to find it now. <laughs> Better. Sorry for the delay once again. As you can see, we, we might be uh, well esteemed in uh, the occult circles, but we're fairly useless with IT. Looks more like it, doesn't it? Thank you, brethren. To understand the motives for forming a new order, Michael, sorry, apologies. Um, yeah. I can see your. I can see a load of files come up. I can't see your actual presentation. Ah, I'm seeing my. Is it? Is it a PowerPoint presentation? It is. Yeah. Okay, it's not coming through just yet. Okay. Um, do I stop the share and try it again? Yeah, stop the share. Open the file up on your um, computer first of all. Yeah. And then go to share screen and then just select the one you would like to play. Is that better? Perfect. Done. Great stuff. Okay, thanks. To understand the motives for forming a new order in 1902, I believe that the following events in 1901 may have played their part. The Order of Light and the Sat Bai, as Philip has mentioned, uh, had actually been fused together in 1891. So when there was the publication of Rudyard Kipling's bestseller Kim in October 1901, a very well-known novel which features a secret spiring of the same name. Well, this could only bring unwelcome interest in anything that met that was called sat by. Phillips also mentioned the prosecution of Madame Horace and the associated sexual scandal in December 1891. And this put the golden dawn on the front pages of all the UK papers and was vilified in music hall songs. The Horus Temple members were particularly at risk in this respect, and they must have been fearful of, of their losing their valued social standing. The Theosophical Society had had a number of difficult years after the death of its founder, Madame Blavatsky, and locally there had been splits and resignations under Annie Besant's leadership. To make matters worse, the Northern section uh, branch of the esoteric section of the TS was called the Horus Lodge. The Order of Light then was the only name remaining which would not attract unwanted attention. I think that 
the remaining members of these three organizations may not have valued the inclusion of women in these organizations. And this may have been after the problem that the Horus Temple had with Annie Horniman almost 10 years earlier. So was it then that the cumulative events previously explained led members of the Horus Temple undercover with other Masonic brethren from the dormant order of light stroke sat by and the esoteric section of the Theosophical Society were they drawn to the idea of the order that was laid out on the meeting held on the 9th of January, the minutes of which you can see in the left hand photo. Was it a question of the club is dead, long live the club? But if it was, this club was now absorbed into masonry. After the initial meeting on the 9th of January, the founding brethren spared little time in developing the order. By April, the companions of Garuda started meeting at the Hermetic Society rooms in Watson's building in Bradford. The minutes of that meeting can be seen in the, the illustration in the center. It was resolved at this initial meeting that the newly formed August Order of Light would take on the assets and liabilities of the Hermetic Society with immediate effect. And the minutes of the Companions of Garuda, you can see dated on the 10th of April, confirmed that that resolution was carried. It's not clear what authority all nine of the brethren present were acting, nor the nature exactly or the identity of the Hermetic Society. The Horus Temple of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn would obviously be a logical contender and Mackay, Martin, Gardner and Pattinson were members of that organisation and present on that occasion. But light can be seen on this from the Horus Temple Library catalogue of 1891, which you can see on the right hand side. This is evidence which, contrary to uh, Bob Gilbert's conclusion that Philip cited earlier, that the Horus Temple found premises, the Horus Temple actually did find premises of its own at Watson's chamber. The so-called Hermetic Society, therefore, simply being a cover for its real identity. Evidence to support my theory can be found, therefore, in the properties of the August Order of Light inherited, the library of the Horus Temple is impressive, but only a small section of the Horus Temple library uh, makes up the much larger AOL library and much of the theosophical works must have come from other sources. Secondly, we can see the evidence in the regalia used by the Order of Light in the photographs which follow. And thirdly, the ritual the AOL founders were able to assemble from the combined or compounded rituals of the organizations that founded it. During these early years, the order was referred to as the Masonic Order of Light, certainly in minutes of the order meetings, perhaps uh, to emphasize a break from the past, but the order was still an esoteric order as perhaps in the UK, the only Masonic esoteric order which had no requirement for any Christian belief. Could I have the next? Oh, I'm, I'm doing the slides, aren't I? <laughs> the order meetings or Ashianas were held at Salem Street Masonic Rooms Bradford from March 1902 to May 1903 but by September 1903 the, move, the order moved its more permanent home to 81 Kings Arcade and from that date Ashianas or meetings of the Council of Garuda and the Society were all held there. We can assume from this that the Hermetic Society rooms were then permanently vacated. 81 Kings Arcade and the photographs you can see are photographs from that temple, um, was to be the home of the August Order of Light for the next 36 years. On the 26th of September, 1903, 
William Wynne Westcott was admitted to the second degree of the order and reference was made to his membership of the earlier order. After this, two other aspirants were admitted to the order in the first degree, but the following day, Westcott was made president of the Council of Agni. The left hand photograph shows the temple uh, looking from the west towards the east. And if you look carefully, you will see on the pillars uh, Hindu deities on both the pillars and the arch. The right hand side photo shows the temple looking from the east towards the west and the figures seen on the pillars and arch are from the Egyptian pantheon. Note both photos show a circular carpet and looking east you can see a sphere and ring and a small statue of Osiris. Also note the lion chairs in both east and west and suspended gongs for use by the officers. And you will also note from the lighting behind the arches in the Garden of the West, <coughs> that electric lighting was being used. This temple was designed in the first decade of the 20th century. And this was state of the art. It enabled rituals to be audio visual experiences. These scenes from the arches will be familiar to our Hindu brethren. These are the, the original arches which we have preserved today in, in our archives. The spiral motif in the centre, which is usually displayed in the south, and the paintings on the left and the right in the east, show great similarities to the work of the recognised first abstract artist, uh, Hilma of Klimt. The artistic transition to abstract art and non-figurative painting of Hilma would occur without any contact with the modern contemporary movements. The works of Hilma are mainly spiritual and our, her artistic works are said to be a consequence of this. Hilma is known to have been very interested in theosophy. However, she didn't start painting in this particular way until 1906. Possibly commissioned by the Order of Light? We have no evidence for this. The paintings could actually be earlier examples of abstract art by another unknown artist. This is possible, but we don't know the date of the paintings or the artist. But these are abstract paintings. And if these paintings represent Jungian archetypes, well, perhaps these are likely to be represented in a similar way by artists or mystics who've had the same meditative experiences. On this slide, we see the falcon god Garuda, the transport of Vishnu, sat on a rock at sunset. Under his great talons, two serpents are trapped. This painting was produced for the order in 1905 by the artist M.R. Jones. Could this, therefore, suggest that the Hilma style paintings previously illustrated were also from a later period? By 1939, King's Arcade was to be demolished and it was left to George Bolton, who was then president of Garuda, last, later to become an arch president, to find suitable premises. Rooms on the top two floors of 52 Godwin Street were selected and a 10 year lease was signed. And this was the home of the order from 1939 until the 1970s. These photographs were taken by Fred Scott in October 1970. No photographs of the order's next home at Castlegate in York, where Philip and I were both initiated, are available. The temple was small, untidy, crowded, and in a basement of the Masonic building. The order was located there from the mid-1970s to 1991. Philip was the key to finding our current home. 
1991, Philip was chairman of the Blackwall Hall Management Committee and was able to arrange for us to have two per the permanent use of three rooms for the storage of regalia and the library of almost a thousand volumes. In 1910, I negotiated the permanent use of the practice room and with the generous help of our members, we converted it into a permanent temple. The photograph on the right shows some of the library books being dried out in the temple, having become damp during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, when the whole building was unoccupied. You can see that we've chosen to take a more minimalist approach of the furnishings. We only chose to use illustrations that featured in the current rituals. Over the last 119 years, there have been many eminent Grand Lodge officers and rulers of other degrees beyond the craft who have been active members of the Order of Light. For instance, there have been six Supreme Magi of the SRIA, including the current uh, Tony Llewellyn, who, good evening Tony, who was on the line, and his two predecessors. Westcourt was an important member of the Order and his talks were a highlight for the early meetings. The second photograph is that of Dr. Edwards. Dr. Edwards worked himself to an untimely death by running the healthcare provision for his entire hometown throughout the First World War and the flu pandemic which followed it. When he died, his obituaries filled the local press and the order produced a slim volume in memoriam. Its sponsors included Rudyard Kipling, Westcott, who by then lived in South Africa, and other contributors from the USA, Australia, and Constantinople. By contrast, the missing picture is that of the other founder, Thomas Henry Pattinson. Literature hasn't been kind to Pattinson. Alec Howe and Robert Gilbert in particular regard him with condescension as something like a, nothing more than a provincial watchmaker. Today, I must fight his corner. Without Pattinson, the order would not have been founded. It was his connections with the occult world of the late 19th century that were the extensive ones. He was a friend and confidant of Madame Blavatsky, and he was the maker of the famous Blavatsky scrying mirrors. His friendship with Aiton gave him access to Portman. In later life, I concede that Thomas Henry Pattinson may have been bad-tempered and grumpy, Brethren all, when I joined the Order of Light, you could be forgiven for thinking that being bad-tempered and grumpy was a qualification for membership. Thomas Henry Pattinson's large silverware Egyptian pieces found in the Egyptian room at Hoyle Court, Bailden, mark him out as one of the great silversmiths of his generation. We need to know a lot more about THP, and I intend to research this further. On the right is a photograph of the uh, American photographer Alpin Langdon Coburn, who was an arch president of the order from 1948 to 1965. He was also a member of the Universal Order and used his position as arch president to try and recruit members of the Order of Light to the Universal Order. Perhaps this had an adverse effect on OAL membership. And by the 1970s, Arch President John Edgar Leach, who had succeeded Coburn, was fearful that the order may fold. John Walker and Andrew Barry Stevenson petitioned for the establishment of Temple No. 2 to be held in Stevenson's attic in Blackheath, London. Andrew sadly passed away last month. He was a true gentleman and I will miss him greatly. But without the intervention of Walker and Stevenson, I wouldn't be giving this paper here tonight. Temple number two was consecrated on the 9th of September 1972 and quickly became a meeting place for the heads of other Masonic orders. After Brothers' departure for New Zealand in 2005, the temple relocated to Radlett, where it still meets regularly. And I'm grateful for the brethren of Temple number two who are on with us this evening for their support. 
I joined the Order of Light in 1987. Fred Scott and Lewis Clark were the Arch Presidents. I completed my second degree in 1988 and 20 years to the day later was installed as Arch President by Eric Gurnall. In 2010, Eric died and I appointed Philip as his successor. In the late 1980s, Philip and I had studied and lectured on the decline of craft masonry in England. And I was keen that we open up the Order of Light to a wider audience, particularly in places where masonry was still in growth. Looking back into the correspondence of the Order, it became clear to me that there had been many requests to export the Order to almost all parts of the globe. And some of these requests go back to the 1930s. Sadly, in my view, these requests had fallen on deaf ears. In 2010, we made a plan and by 2014, with much travel and personal expense, we'd set up temples in Melbourne and Adelaide, Australia, Allentown in the USA and Chennai in India. We have and had five principles for establishing the viability of any new temple. And they are, firstly, is there enough interest in the location to support a working temple? Typically between 20 and 30 founded members are required to keep a temple running. Secondly, would the establishment of a new temple at the location damage the viability of any existing temples, including our own? Thirdly, would the local grand and provincial grand lodges tolerate our order to operate in their region? Fourthly, our preference is that the ritual should always be performed in English. And finally, we expect some of the founders should first become members of Temple Number One and go through the established rituals in Halifax so they have more experience then of introducing those rituals, which are complex. To new members. In 2010, we have also appointed the Temple Number no. One President of Garuda, Dr. Peter Maxwell Stewart, to revise the rituals into 21st century language and to remove from them some of the pseudoscience that last the last 120 years had made obsolete. We're ever in Peter's debt for the hard work and often, often startling ritual he's brought to the order, or they're adding solstice rituals and improving and simplifying the old equinox rituals. The August Order of Light is open to membership of any master mason who is a member of a lodge recognised by the United Grand Lodge of England and who would, in our view, benefit by membership of the order. The application form, which can be found on our website, gives the applicant an opportunity to persuade the reviewing committee, this is the Council of Agni, that they have the right reasons for joining the order. We don't encourage those who seem just want to have another degree, but we will give that teaching of the ceremonies to all who seem worthy. The AOL rituals in part actually do seek to explain the lost secrets of craft masonry. For the most part, there's no new story being told, simply new light on familiar objects and symbols. So if symbolism and multiculturalism interest you, please check out our website. For the future, we are preparing what is known as the second chakram of the order, namely two further ceremonies linked together by another passing degree. This second chakram will, however, only ever be worked in Halifax. Many thanks for your invitation to deliver this presentation to you and to you all for attending and listening. Thank you for uh, being with us tonight. It, it's been a great honor and pleasure and uh, most interesting presentation. So uh, moving on to our Q&A session, uh, we have one hand up by Othman. Othman, would you like to ask a question? Unmute yourself first. Uh, you need to, Othman, you need to unmute yourself.
somebody else. Hoffman yes. Okay, we got okay. there. Hoffman, yes. Sorry, I was trying to say you have to unmute me because I was trying. Okay, Sorry. Okay. Uh, how many chapters, you call them chapter, I assume, yeah. are in English? What, what, what they were called? Uh, temples. Temples. Thank you for that. How many temples are in England? And how far it will take me throughout my Masonic journey? Uh, saying like, I finished the three degrees, I'm a master mason. What more information the order will take me into? Um, within the United Kingdom, there are uh, two temples, as uh, Michael referred to earlier, one in Halifax uh, and one in Radlett, just north of London. Uh, and what we seek to do is to interpret craft masonry in, in, a, in a perhaps a rather different way than, than we will have come across it before, particularly to uh, make allusions to Eastern symbolism uh, and its correlation with uh, with craft Freemasonry, uh, and also perhaps to uh, give an indication of other areas of study, uh, which we will come across in the course of the ritual, particularly the, the, the more Western parts of the ritual. Um, and so it is a, both a, a place of learning and a place of encouraging further research, because we always encourage uh, the preparation of papers, even from those uh, brethren who, do, who are not preparing them as a result of going through the, the degrees in the order. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Michelle, uh, Brother Michelle? Need to unmute yourself, good. Yes, I have, thank you. Good evening. Good. And uh, it's been a most interesting talk. I was just wondering whether, um, you know, as a woman Freemason, that uh, we would be able to join this particular order of the ancient light because it's only speaking of the men's order. Yeah, this is a problem for us. Uh, I, I personally, and I'm speaking personally, not for Philip, um, have absolutely no problem with opening up the order uh, to, to to women masons. Um, the, the problem we have is that we are ultra dependent on, on the United Grand Lodge of England. So we, we would need to get their approval to do that. Um, and I'm not sure whether we would get it. But certainly, um, both Philip and I have been members of other fringe Masonic organisations that were at one time just purely male and then became male and female and the benefit that the ceremonies uh, got from that was absolutely huge. Uh, th there will be other people on, on this uh, meeting who, who will have had the same experience and I'm sure, I'm sure they would agree with me. So if we can find a way of doing it, I would be up for it. One of the downsides that I was told was that, um, it, that the Grand Master of, uh, of uh, women's masonry is the grand master of all the side degrees as well. Uh, that'd be a problem for us, clearly. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'd, I do understand that, and thank you. Um, it's it's just something that I'm. I come from a huge family of masons, um, myself included, obviously, and I would just like to be able to explore different areas. My dad still lives in Malaysia and, um, you know, was a founder member. And uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think um, hopefully in times to come that us women, one way or the other, will be um, able to uh, meet and greet. Well, I, I hope so too. And I'll, I'll let out a secret now in, in front of 260 people. When we rewrote the rituals in 2010, we took all, I know that within women's masonry, you refer to each other as brethren, but we thought it more appropriate to make, make all the rituals gender neutral. Uh, and so we, 10 years, well, 11 years ago, 
we had already been looking to see how this may at some point in the future become part of our organisation. It's not something I would shy away from. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. It, it seems to me that this is perhaps going outside the context of our talk, but it seems to me that there are there's, there seems to be no problem between United Grand Lodge of England and Women's Freemasonry. But the Grand Lodge, United Grand Lodge of England seems constantly want to want to ignore the existence of co-masonry. Uh, uh, yeah. that, that seems to be a real issue as, that I see. Uh, and that may be uh, one of the problems that we may have in, in continuing to use um, buildings uh, which are effectively owned by lodges uh, within the United Grand Lodge of England that we may lose the benefit of the what is in effect a subsidised use of those buildings uh, and we might have to look more commercially if we severed our links with, with UGLE well, or at least our tolerance by UGLE because of course no order in the, in, in the United Kingdom is approved of by UGLE because they only recognise the three degrees and the arch so yeah it's it's as much an organisational problem as, as, a, as a philosophical one, as I see it. Yeah, I, I think that's a real shame, actually. I think myself. perhaps it's, um, brethren, probably a conversation to be had at a, a later date and time. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Brother Graham. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's very fascinating. I was just interested... Um, I like to visit other temples, etc. And I just wondered if it's possible to ever visit your temple and uh, have a look round and uh, have a tour and look at the books in your library, that sort of thing. But I, I think at the moment, at least, it uh, it's only open to members. Okay, thank you. Great. We have one more question on chat. Uh, a couple of brothers was asking, uh, were asking about the procedure um, in, uh, on, uh, of joining the August Order of Light and how long it takes for a brother to actually be initiated into it, inducted into it. About an hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, from, yeah. from when they yeah. actually um, put, put down their petition and until they actually get uh, initiated. Right. Let, let me talk you through the process. The, the, uh, the, the right way to apply for membership of the Order of Light, and there may be people who are members of the Order who, who don't want me to say this, but the right way to do it is that you go onto our website, which I think the, the, was given with the circular. Um, on, on there, you find the membership form, you fill it in, and you, it, it's a PDF that's, that's, uh, that's a live document. That then gets sent to Australia. Uh, where uh, our web um, master then receives that document, he immediately forwards that to, to me and I then look over the document and immediately pass that forward to the Council of, of Agni. The Council of Agni is made up with the leaders of each of the temples plus the arch presidents, uh, plus a couple of chosen brethren. Uh, and they will then, obviously they won't know the candidate, but they will simply look at the application form and the reasons that were given for joining. That generally, that whole process usually is, is completed within a week. And we were then, depending on where the brother is, he will then be allocated to, or he, he will have expressed the, the temple that he wants to join. And we will then pass that on to the present Garuda of that temple and ask them to make the candidate to, uh, available for, uh, to arrange his, uh, his initiation. If it's in temple number one, typically that may take, but well, we only have two ceremonies a year that do the first degree ceremony. So if you miss one, you could have to wait six months. Uh, in the last 18 months, obviously it's been a bit worse than that because we haven't met at all for, for <laughs> over 12 months. So we've not done a first degree ceremony since um, September uh, uh, 2019. Um, but that, that will change. So, yes, we, we've got a, a short, I think all the temples have, have got people in the pipeline. Um, but in principle, 
where where space permits, then we would we have run uh, multi candidate ceremonies where there's been a need to do it, uh, and and we will continue to do that. Great, great, great. Uh, and another oh, uh, brother Murat uh, would like Murat Gulbakan would like to ask a question. Yes. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Brother Michael and uh, Philip. I'd like to ask a question. I mean, uh, of course, by um, by reading uh, books and stuff, we can like learn uh, about our um, interests. Um, I am more interested in the teachings of uh, Alistair Crowley. Um, would uh, some teachings in in your order? Are there any teachings in your order, uh, which 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 um, which are like um, linked to Alistair Crowley on, and his path? No, we certainly don't have anything that uh, resembles OTO rituals. You, you do not? No, uh, although there are, there are Kabbalistic references, uh, mm -hmm. explicit Kabbalistic references in our rituals. But so, there, is, there is nothing in our, in our rituals that connect with the OTO at all. Okay, all right, thank you. Brother Derek. Thank you very much, I, <clears throat> and thank you to both of you who enjoyed that talk. Now, briefly, on on one point, you mentioned Christianity, and my question is going to be, do you consider the order Christian or, or secular? Um, neither. Uh, it's definitely not a Christian order. Uh, we have at least 30% of the membership are Hindu. Um, it's certainly not secular because 30% of the membership are Hindu. So um, it, it's, it's neither. Uh, it's it's a, an organization that accepts people like masonry of, of all creeds. So why shouldn't an esoteric order of masonry accept all, all creeds? Uh, it, it makes life a lot easier for, for the people who are, are interested. Thank you for that. Thank you. It's, uh, Brother Adrian, Howden. Hi, yes, uh, I think my question's probably been answered. Um, having done a little bit of research before this, uh, this the talk, and it was really, really good, I've, I've got to say. There was some, uh, uh, I found mentioned to, to Portman and, and to, to Crowley, whom personally I find uh, slightly unsavoury. Um, what's Portman's in, in, in involvement? Because I missed the first bit, actually. What, what is Portman's uh, involvement in, in the start of, the, of, this, uh, of this, this order? Well, that's the, the subject of conjecture because the, the order, when it found, was founded in 1902, the, the founders stated it was ritual that was passed down from Portman to Aiton to Pattinson and Edwards. But the, what was passed down at each of those stages is very unclear. Right. Um, because there, there, is, there is confusion between different organizations all using very similar names uh, and so what we've ended up with uh, we're not quite sure where it's all come from but not all of it can have come from from Morris Fiedel Portman because the history doesn't work out that way right yeah no, no uh, thank you appreciate it we have one last question uh, brother Colin Kendrick would you like to uh, ask your question Oh, yes, thank you for that. Yes, no, I was just curious, you meant, you did mention that there was regalia, and I was wondering what that was. And I was also wondering about uh, lodge officers within the uh, the structure. Right, well, uh, that's, that's a good question. Thank you very much for asking that. Um, the, the, the regalia of the order is, is a little unusual. Um, Philip and I look a bit like defrocked Catholic priests when we're in our full regalia, um, uh, but the, the general is, is very much, some people regard it as looking rather like they're a surgeon uh, because of the construction of, of, the, of the gowns. Um, so yeah, the, the, the regalia is, uh, is, is um, unusual in, in a sense, um, but not, not desperately so. As for the officers, uh, the officers are all Hindu gods, uh, or the names of Hindu gods. Uh, and there's a very interesting paper that was given by uh, Alvin Langdon Coburn, uh, who in the 1940s, he wrote a paper suggesting that the, 
practice of absorbing the the god form is something that the officers of, of the order should do that so if you are um for instance that uh, one of the gods uh, uh, yama is is an office uh, and, and yama is the god of death so if you are the god of death then you should absorb yourself with that as you should, uh, as you conduct the ceremony which is a very interesting idea and of course, to the candidate who's been led by death, uh, that, that has a, a, a fairly memorable effect on him. All right, Thank, thanks for that. That's, uh, that, that really does, um, yeah, that, that tells a lot. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Brethren, thank you. Uh, Brother Michael, Brother Philip, it's been a pleasure and an honor once again. You've been most enlightening in every sense of the word and most fitting word, might I add. Uh, now, I'd like, with great pleasure, I'd like to uh, announce and welcome uh, our speaker for next week, who is none other than the Provincial Grand Orator of uh, Forensics, Worshipful Brother Mark Smith, to conduct his talk entitled For Valor, The Story of the Victoria Cross. For 14 years, Mark has been the curator of the Royal Artillery Museum in London. He is one of the, uh, the medals and militia experts on the BBC's long running program, The Antique Show, and has appeared on many other programs. He also broadcasts on radio and television with British forces broadcasting and has written five books on World War I and genealogy. Uh, our winners for tonight our uh, worshipful brother Tom Hates and uh, brother Praveen Anamalu. Uh, I have their uh, details and we'll be, we will be sending them their mugs. So brethren, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Looking forward to seeing you next week and uh, stay safe. Have a good evening, morning, afternoon. <laughs> okay. Thank you.